Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to episode number 75 of the Nautel TTT webinar series. This is where I guessed. I'm, I'm hoping it's 75. I built the slide cover myself today because I wasn't paying enough attention. Uh, Mr. Disembodied Boy said Sylvester's in the background, so I'm sure he'll jump in to correct me if I'm wrong. I'm your host, Jeff Welton, and we're going to have a, a little bit of a different twist today, a, a unique conversation. Oh, I say unique. I mean, you know how these things work. We uh, find something that I feel we should talk about. That's what we do. As always, I try to find people smarter than me to do this stuff. And uh, today I uh, I hit the jackpot. So we'll hit that in a second. First, the housekeeping. Actually, I tell you what, we'll introduce our guests first and make them sit through the housekeeping too. Um, so first and foremost, since he's already clicked his camera on, we've got the handsome, the talented Mr. Kirk Harnack. And uh, Kirk, you are a business uh, business development guy. I clicked off your title, so I have to guess. I th th I'm se senior. The senior is the first word. That means I'm old. Um, senior solutions consultant. So I I help people take our round pegs and fit them in their square holes. And that sounds like a full time job on it all <laughs> on its own. Now we've also uh, moving up the corporate ladder. We got an SVP with us, Cam Iker. And Cam, you. Uh, at first, I want to say welcome, but I'm going to give you, and we didn't talk about this in the preamble, but uh, I was uh, scoping out LinkedIn and Facebook and various other things because we don't get to talk here as much as we should. And I noticed that uh, you've got an anniversary coming up in about a month and a half, 10 years at uh, TELUS Alliance now. Well, I, I do. Thanks for noticing. Um, or is that stalking in this internet world? I can never tell the difference there. But no, uh, seriously, I thanks think for, intent, uh, intent is the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. No, I'm happy to be here and uh, appreciate the invite and, um, you know, looking forward to trying to hold up the uh, my end of the, the mantle here. There you go. Like I said, people smarter than me that uh, the, the bar's not really high, so we're, we should be good to go. Um, all right. Mandatory housekeeping stuff. Uh, we do make these as interactive as we can. Uh, Cam says or Elaine says, hi, Cam, you're looking ornery as ever. So uh, Elaine's already found the little enter question for staff section where you can uh, type in a question, comment, criticism, concern, uh, try to make me chuckle on air, whatever floats your boat. Um, hit the send button, it'll pop up on my screen. The cool thing, Cam and Kirk can't see it, so they're gonna rely on me to translate. Uh, that can get entertaining as well. If you're not shy and you've got a microphone, hit the little hand wavy icon, you can see up halfway up the screen. And uh, we'll unmute you and make you part of the conversation. If you are an SBE member, this does qualify for half of her credit under Schedule I, I believe, Category I of the research schedule. So don't forget to write that down. I just realized I got my reminder from Megan the other day telling me that my certification is due in about a month and a half. So I guess it's time to get the form filled out. But uh, on that note, let's move forward. So our conversation, today is uh, it's virtualization. And we're gonna kind of go both ways because we're gonna do virtualization and containerization. And uh, I'm gonna leave it up to Kirk and Cam to explain the differences because again, they can uh, do it better than I can. But first we always leave the uh, opportunity to do advanced questions when you register. Uh, and folks, I'm gonna scold you a little bit. Uh, when you're doing your advanced questions, try to keep them relevant to the topic, although we'll hit them. Um, Update and internet software and AM transmitters, I'm assuming is talking about the AUI and that's the question everybody's asking. Um, my really short answer is, boy, I hope it's done before I retire. Um, but uh, realistically, I've got a, a Beta VX2 running on my station right now. It's uh, just shy of a week on air and it's running the new AUI. So you should see it a lot sooner than the last time you asked, um, but I'm not gonna commit to a time. Um, RDS for the VS300, that's a question. Uh, reach out to support at nautel.com. They'll be happy to help you out with that. Or certainly you can uh, ping me offline and uh, I'm happy to answer that. All right, so virtualization and, and what kind of, it, it was coincidental. And uh, I believe he's in an airplane at the moment, unless he's uh, sitting in an airport in Honolulu. But uh, Shane Tobin put up a post a couple of days ago in the broadcasting club and uh, he's uh, doing, he was over in American Samoa and put up a virtualized system. And, and Kirk, you had uh, mentioned in the preamble, it's like, I'm not sure why this is all so new because we've been doing it for a while now. 
Yeah, and indeed we have a uh, boy uh, three four years ago. Uh, I put up a, a translator in Cleveland, Mississippi, and the only good way to feed it was over public internet. Uh, we were generating the audio forty miles away, and we used a, a software audio processor that that Omnia sells uh, with micro MPX. Sent that across the public internet with plenty of buffering because it's, we were going through a number of different providers to get there, and um, and provide and then you know at the transmitter site. Uh, appliance called the Omnia MPX node takes IP in from the internet and gives you uh, analog multiplex out, which goes right into a transmitter. And I mean, it, it's one of those things, uh, you know, a lot of folks, I think, confuse um, virtualization with uh, cloud-based and, and the two don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to be even related at all. They don't even have to be in the same ballpark. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now, the other thing that, uh, and that's, uh, I just grabbed a little Google search to uh, define virtualization. And, and the key sentence here, and, and this is where I'm probably going to segue over to your stuff. Because, um, so Kirk's got a bunch of slides that, again, explain this stuff a lot better than I can, and he and Cam can run through them. But um, the big deal is uh, a virtualized machine runs its own operating system. And, and you all do a lot with containerization, where the where the, the it's basically a virtual machine using the host computer's uh, OS, if I'm not, you know, isn't that about right? A container. Yeah, that's that's one one way to explain. That. There are other probably more important factors, but that that is a factor. It sure is. So I am going to hand the controls over to you right now, Mr. Harnack, and you should have a little uh, little thing on your screen that says Jeff has given you the reins. If How you about will. that, do we see a slide with, with way too much text on it? It's not my usual wall of text is the best part. <laughs> All right. Uh, th thanks, Jeff and, and my cohort, Cam Eichers here to uh, he's here for two reasons to keep me in my lane uh, and also to point out important things that uh, that I may forget, because, you know, what's important to me? You know, Cam has a has this better overall view and, uh, you know, I'm pretty much pretty well down my lane. Um, in, in, indeed, uh, uh, Jeff, you mentioned the, there's a difference between virtualization and containerization. Containerization, I would uh, quantify it as containerization is a slightly newer and more sophisticated form of virtualization. Virtualization, by that definition that you put on the screen, you know, means anything that's not quite real, but it's doing something that that is is needed, uh, has value, and it's appreciated. So. Um, uh, you know, we've been we've been virtualizing um, our our radio station automation systems literally since the late 1980s. That's when the, one of the first systems came out. Uh, Smarts came out, um, and some people were you know using it to play 8-bit audio files, uh, commercials typically. Uh, not you know hard drives weren't big enough to hold songs. Uh, MP3 wasn't uh, uh, wasn't popular or uh, uh, yet not very popular. Uh, so you know, virtualization is anytime we 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 create an abstraction, a layer of abstraction. And um, uh, so I've got a, I got a slide related to that coming up. Um, but while I just start to carry us through a kind of a logical progression here through a few slides, and please feel welcome to interrupt me. And hey, uh, audience, uh, pop up your questions. And Jeff, you feel welcome to interrupt me as well. Uh, to, uh, to to you know to answer answer a question that I'm leaving hanging here, um, at, at so many companies and Telos Alliance is is, is no uh, exception. We like to ask what if because we're always looking for the next thing, the next you know the next way to make the company several million dollars, to make the lives of engineers easier and better, uh, more liable, let us get more sleep, let the phone not ring at 2 a.m. that kind of thing, and. Uh, you know, years ago, uh, Steve Church, the founder of Telos, asked, what if I could take some of this new DSP, this digital signal processing, and apply it to a telephone hybrid? You know, what if? And so we ended up with the very first piece of broadcast gear that had DSP in it. Yeah. Um, late, later on, Steve asked, wait a minute, this ISDN thing, that you can bond two B channels together and get 128 kilobits from here to there. This is you know, before the internet. And, oh, this MP3 thing, that works at 128 kilobits. Hmm, what if I married those two things together? And so out came the very first uh, application of, uh, of MP3 for real-time transmission. Um, so 
uh, and, and then there's been been other you know things have what, what if we built a multi a multi line phone system that was based entirely on SIP and VoIP technology? So what if is an important question. So what if we could take um, audio consoles or on air phone systems, things that you know Telos Alliance knows something about audio processing as well, and even broadcast intercoms. What if we could virtualize those and and not just virtualize them, but what if we could put them in this new form of virtualization called containers? And we'll talk in a few minutes about the benefit of containers over just simply VMs, virtual machines, uh, in, in in a few minutes. All right. Uh, there, there's a before you, yeah. before you get going. One uh, key thing there too is um, we've got a room full of engineering types here and. Uh, one of the things we all know is the fewer parts you have, the fewer parts you've got to fail. And so, you know, assuming, and this sometimes can be a big assumption, but assuming our software is stable, then the less least amount of hardware we've got it running on, the better off we are. Now, that, that yeah. will also lead to its own things, and that that's a discussion several slides down, But uh, but yeah. And and that actually that's a great philosophical discussion to have, and probably one that would take longer than than we have in this discussion here. You know, plenty of engineers are are delighted to have. Hey, I got a box in the rack. It's got four screws holding it in the rack, and it's an analog box, and it does this. By the way, almost everything you buy nowadays has a computer in it anyway, right? It's the computer that the manufacturer selected. It's an operating system the manufacturer selected. And uh, and it's software that the manufacturer wrote, uh, so or farmed out to have written. So it's hard to buy anything these days that's just you know a collection of capacitors and transistors and ICs. Uh, that that just doesn't hardly exist anymore. If it does, it's in the simplest things. So we asked this question about what if with regard to some new technology. What if we could uh, spin up these devices quickly in in minutes and not days? What if we could obviously control them from anywhere, important during COVID and, and after. What if we could control them via a browser? So that means you're not limited to having an app installed on, on, a, on a particular laptop or computer or phone. What if you could just use your browser to control these things? And largely you can. And then what if it could be deployed um, on premises with a capital S at the end? I just now see that for the first time. Or in, or in the cloud. So you have your choice. Do I de deploy well, this in a space I already have or or in somebody else's space? And see, that, that capital S is critical because, uh, as, as we said, uh, you put more stuff into a into a bag, you know, then uh, when the bag rips, you've got a bigger catastrophe. So you better have two bags, premises. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's and that's actually one of the you know, if if you're if you're going to have uh, a backup audio processor, you know, in the older days, pre, you know, doing this on computers, you had to buy another audio processor. Now, it, it might be um, a cheaper one, something that you, you just use temporarily, or it might be a full fledged you know copy of, of the expensive one that you have. Well, what if, uh, you, you know, the, the and and that audio processor was very specifically built as purpose built equipment and you know purpose built equipment can be lovely but it's very purpose built and if if a part that goes in it becomes non obtainium and and you need it it becomes a boat anchor so one of the benefits that we'll learn about here or we'll we'll re come to realize is that the 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 thing that makes computer servers special is there's nothing special about them an HP and a Dell and a super micro server, they all got to run somebody else's software in very similar ways. So there's, they, they are truly are commodities. Yeah, you can buy different sizes, of course, and, and a few extra features, you know, RAID or not RAID or two power supplies or four power supplies, uh, you know, two network interfaces or six network interfaces. I, I, I get that. But the actual running of software it doesn't care. It, it, they're, they're, they need to be generic. They have to be generic. Okay, let's move on. So these days, here's what's possible uh, right now. You can have a playout system that operates uh, in a VM, and some manufacturers are putting this into containers right now. Um, there's the Telos VXS, which is a containerized multi-studio, multi-line VoIP phone system. Um, you can have an, an audio console called the uh, the Axia Altus uh, that runs in a container and is controlled by a browser. Uh, there's Infinity VIP, which runs in a container. That's a, a, a um, an intercom system, and it, and it can work in a 
a TV studio, a radio studio, or can you can connect people literally all around the world over public internet. And then here's an audio processor, uh, brand new from uh, our Omnia friends called the Omnia Forza. So this are and and you can see the the architecture here. Um, those orange boxes, that's those are the containers, and they are all uh, controlled by a um, container management system or a, a container um, runtime system. Typically, this is called Docker. Uh, there are others. Docker is is compliant with a standard. And then that runs on a host operating system. Uh, by the way, that host operating system can can itself be a virtual machine on a you know sharing space with other VMs on a computer, or or you can do this a little more simply, uh, and that is that host operating system is uh, working on the bare metal of that server itself. Um, so, okay, Cam, any any comments? Have I missed anything obvious right here? No, you're doing a great job, Kirk. We'll let you get a drink of water. And um, I think the idea, um, you know, going back to this is, is as we go through this, there's lots of different ways to put these systems together. So if something that you guys are seeing on the screen doesn't match up with your kind of mental image of virtualization or how you might do something, it's a great opportunity to ask a question and, and see if there's a different method to approach this. Because again, as Kirk will talk more about, um, lots of ways to get from point A to point B. Right. And I mean, I'll, I'll drop in with a, a, a real life example, and, and I'm going to apologize for being uh, going against brand. But, uh, you know, our, our little station, we run Play One Tool. Uh, we've got a uh, internal processor in the transmitter. I've got a um, stereo tool license. Uh, so my Play One computer is also running traffic. It's running the uh, stereo tool processing for the backup audio. And I mean, we've got that duplicated on three different machines. So I've got ultimate redundancy of my entire system. And if any one of them goes down, it, it's really totally irrelevant. We just grab another one and carry on. That's a good point. And, and the, what makes uh, containers different is their uh, manageability uh, automatically and even very nearly instantaneously. So by the way, if, if, uh, if you've used PayPal or almost any financial service or purchased anything online, there's a very good chance you're not actually using virtual machines in cloud instances. You're using containers. The Fortune 500 companies have all moved or are in the process of moving to containerized software. Of all things, last summer, I'm playing putt-putt golf with my son. It's on a Saturday, sunny Saturday afternoon. And we get behind uh, a, a foursome and we start. To, I start talking with, with the uh, gentleman there and he says he's in IT, he's an IT manager. I said, I'm kind of curious, are you, are you guys uh, in your business, are, are you using um, uh, containers yet? And the, he's in financial and insurance services in IT. And he said, oh, yeah, we use them all the time. That's that's what we're, we're I mean, we're almost everything we do now has already been moved over to, to containers. So, so, so this is really de rigueur. It's normal for you guys. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll talk in a few minutes about some of the the other the other benefits there. Let's move on. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we've we've been virtualizing since well, technically the late 1980s, but maybe more of you in the early 1990s. Um, I worked at Scott Studios during uh, 1995 and 96, um, and obviously we were replacing cart machines and CD players and putting everything on on hard drive. Um, and so uh, we've been virtualizing for quite a while. The, the, the software that you used to punch up the next song or hit a hot button, you, know, you have, you have in effect, virtualized the piece of gear you used to use, the cart machine or the reel-to-reel -reel or the turntable, whatever it was. Um, and, and, and so this is just taking that a step, a, a step further. We, we already... Go ahead. So, so Elaine had asked, uh, re relating to the uh, the containers, if there were any synchronization issues that needed to be addressed. And, and I mean, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to make a guess, and then you can tell me why I'm wrong. But but it would seem to me that the cool thing about a containerized system is that they're all referencing the same system clock. So they're by by definition going to be more synchronized than separate boxes would. In, indeed, and in most environments that are off-premises, you know, so on-premises you can use uh, to connect audio between things. Typically, you're going to use live wire or AES-67. In a cloud environment, you are almost surely going to be using AES-67, and that requires PTP v2 clock. 
uh, or something as good as PTP v2, which is which is really precise. It's way better than NTP, Network Time Protocol. Uh, network Time Protocol, in order to average being good enough to be PTP, takes about 30 days of averaging sampling to be accurate enough. So NTP is fine for setting your clock. Uh, it's not good enough for uh, instantaneous financial transactions and who got there first and or clocking real-time audio. So uh, if you're using AES67, you got to have PTP. And even in the cloud environments, if they don't have PTP available to you directly, the system clock in the compute instance you're using is kept accurate with PTP. And so you just call on your system clock and it's going to be accurate. Uh, as as accurate as, as PTP. But I just want to point out that we, we've been virtualizing for a long time in, in a manner of speaking. Um, all right. Um, a container-based broadcast studio might look something like this. Here we have actually a, a mix of things that are containerized and not containerized. So, for example, uh, an, an Axia uh, Quasar console is not virtualized as in, in a server, although its mixing engine is running on a one rack unit uh, server. Uh, in this case, it's it's not it's not virtualized as a container. Um, and then you have maybe some uh, uh, some of our, our intercom panels, which of course they're running software on ARM processors inside them. Uh, but if you want to use it externally, uh, then chances are you'd be talking uh, to a containerized instance. Infinity VIP is one of the four containers that's shown here. Um, you can also have, you know, if you want an extra console, well, spin up an Axia Altus console there in, in the containerized system and run it with a browser as shown on that uh, tablet in the upper right-hand corner. Um, hey, maybe you still love your Omnia 11 processor. Well, that's not virtualized, at least not yet. And so there it is, uh, uh, you know, running it as, as a piece of hardware, but we all know it's running software inside. In fact, it, it's Linux running in, inside it. Same thing for the phone system. Uh, yeah. I was say that's one of the cool things. And, and I think that's the thing that I keep coming back to when people get talking about virtualization is, is in containerization either or. Is, it, it's really more about power and flexibility. I mean, we've got options that we never could have envisioned even 20, 15 years ago, even. By the way, this some people really look at step. Oh, go ahead. Oh, it's because this is just a step in the evolution. So going back to uh, Kirk's previous slide of Mr. Suspenders there, um, you've got different definitions for different people when it comes to virtualization. And I remember sitting in a customer's office, it's probably been seven or eight years ago now, um, all ready to talk to them about the future of virtualization and maybe their move to containerized systems in these radio studios in a box and and after about 10 or 15 minutes of talking, you kind of get that sense that you're just not connecting with these folks and, and you're getting that glazed look. And, and we stopped for a moment and dug into a little bit more of what they were trying to do. And what they really wanted is they wanted to be able to control their audio console with a, with a PC. You know, do you have an app that can like run in Windows and, and do this? And, and we're going, oh, yeah, we've been doing that since the, you know, since the late 90s, right? No, no problem at all. So it's this idea of where are you on that number line with virtualization? And as Kirk said, you know, cart machines were maybe some of the first things to go. And then your instant replay turned into a screen of squares that you could click on and, and uh, make music with or spots. And then moving into all the various things that um, we've been talking about so far. And one of the cool things about Telos is you pop the lid off of one of our hardware boxes and there's no secret that there's an x86 processor in a lot of them. So the idea is, how do you extract this really cool functionality and this really cool technology and be able to run that in a different platform, whether it's a server that goes in a rack or an AWS instance or, you know, potentially even a Raspberry Pi, as you were showing in your first slide. So it, it expands the opportunities for how you can build a radio facility. It doesn't mean that you have to go all in and everything has to be virtual. It doesn't mean that um, you can't have some hardware controls if you've got operators that are more comfortable with it, which is why I really like the one, if you can jump one ahead, Kurt, to where you were, this hybrid approach of there are going to be some people that they got to have a button to mash. There's going to be folks that have to have a handset to hold, and there's lots of software solutions that will let you answer and manage your phone calls. 
but some people have to be able to slam down that receiver from when the guy from Buffalo <laughs> talks too long. You know, you got to have that oomph and, and get rid of them. So this is just, as you're saying, Jeff, a great way of expanding the options and the flexibility and how you can put studios together and giving the engineers out there a lot more ways in which they can they can fill the needs of their workflow and the needs of, needs of their customers. And I'm that guy. I've uh, still got a landline in the house, and I still have an old Northern Telecom phone. And the only time it ever gets answered is when the primary phone in the house says unknown name, unknown number. So I've got something that's got a little bit of heft when, <laughs> when I want to end the call with uh, authority. Um, right. Before we get rolling here, uh, William had mentioned that he's not uh, seeing the Altis on the Telus Alliance website. And uh, just uh, so he's intrigued in some more information, I'll, uh, I'll shoot his contact info on that. And uh, just uh, wanted to know if it was ready to go or if he's not looking right. William's got sharp eyes. So mm -hmm. um, Altus is a release that's coming soon. Um, you know, after our engineers get stuffed up with some turkey with the upcoming holidays, um, we hope to have that out in the wild here in early December. It is the evolution of the IQS console. So um, all the information you see on the website that is referring to IQS, um, that's what Altus is going to sort of merge into. And, um, and then we add some additional features, some additional capabilities out there to expand the platform even further. So uh, full details coming soon, but reach out to us at Telos and we'll be happy to give you kind of the inside scoop if you need any details. The, um, John, John mentions here that a water main break in their studio got them looking at virtualizing everything. And uh, so he's just waiting on y'all to get more stuff virtualized for him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's all coming. And I, and I realized that, uh, 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 Altus was going to bring up some some questions, and those of you already familiar with IQS, um, there was uh, some developmental things that kept us from uh, taking IQS a whole lot farther, uh, further, and so IQS is still available, and it runs on a piece of hardware that you can buy from us, and it's a great little solution. It doesn't require you know you to to know any amazing Linux or Docker stuff. You you, you buy this very small piece of hardware called our AE1000 engine, and you we we install IQS on it for you. You get a box that I mean it's it's so easy. It just plugs right in. We got videos on the website about how that works. Altus is uh, it ha will will have uh, has the ability to have more features and one of those is remote contribution and monitoring audio uh, because the 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 Altus uh, allowed us to implement WebRTC in it whereas IQS um, the the uh, uh, platform that we developed it on uh, made it uh, nearly impossible to to put WebRTC in it so Altus you, you can additionally license remote uh, audio for monitoring and for contribution um, uh, using that built-in WebRTC. So this is a, you know, a container-based broadcast studio. It's actually a hybrid. Some things are containers, some are not, but you can see the things that you can add. This is what a cloud system would look like. Um, you would have some audio codecs, and that might be built into some of these, uh, these apps like um, WebRTC, typically using Opus. Um, you might have some other of our products that you could use uh, different codecs uh, or our link product, which is a, a collection of Opus codecs. Um, but you could have all this in, in a cloud instance if you wanted to. Not everybody wants that. Not everybody's ready to do it. Um, and, and that's fine. That's why it's it's there's really operationally there's very little difference in whether you do this on premises or whether you do this in a data center or a public cloud like like AWS. And uh, I mean, the one caveat I put in with that, and uh, I'm going to tell my joke that I've, I've been promising it would be the last time I tell this joke every time I told it for the last three months, it's not going to be the last time. But, uh, you know, I, I live way out in the woods in the middle of nowhere and uh, do a lot of hiking with the dogs. And I've, I've gotten in the habit when I'm going out in the woods, I take about 20 feet of fiber optic cable and coil it up and put it in my pocket. And that way, if we do get off the trail a little, maybe somebody was chasing a rabbit or something, not me usually, but uh, get off, off the trail a little bit and I get a little sideways, I can always take that uh, coil of fiber optic cable out of my pocket and unroll it on the ground and then just sit down, eat a granola bar, have a drink of water. Within half an hour, a backhoe will come by to cut it and I get a lift out. Um, and so if you are going with cloud-based, redundancy needs to be a primary focus. And, and that's just something else that a lot of folks 
sometimes we'll jump heavily into something feet first without really looking at all the all, all the things we need to think about. So, so yeah, that, that, that uh, you know. And and you you bring up a, a a good point. Of course, we all realize that if the internet at our home goes away, Amazon still works. Yeah, you, know, you you can whip out your phone. You can go to your neighbor's house. You can go to your office if you need to make an Amazon.com purchase, right? Um, and, and the AWS uh, data centers are all served by multiple uh, backbones. Uh, yes. in, in a, so so if you put something in the cloud, yeah, you got to worry about your last mile, but you don't have to worry about their last mile. Typically, no. And odds are their uptime is going to be a lot more than the server running in a racket or transmitter site. Yeah. And yeah. it also and, depends mm -hmm. upon how, how, what your level of local contribution is. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at the diagram that's on the screen and all of your audio is already in that playout system, it doesn't really matter if your local internet goes out, right? You just can't necessarily access your AWS account to be able to make changes, uh, but everything still goes on as normal. If you're trying to contribute WebRTC to an AWS instance and your local internet goes out, then yeah, you better have a backup in place. So there's a lot of different ways to look at those applications and, and see. Um, something else that's really good about cloud um, deployments, though, is for the person that had the water main break, um, using this as a disaster recovery type of instance. Because, yep. again, your AWS instance isn't going to have a water main break, or if it does, you spin it up in a different data center in a different location, and you're right. still up and running with a completely redundant broadcast facility uh, without having to have any local on-premise hardware. And that kind of ties into something that we've done together, and I don't know if it's in Kirk's slides or not, but uh, where we had uh, done some virtualized HD running uh, Omnia 9EX and uh, worked like a champ. We had it hosted in four different Amazon servers plus the hardware version sitting at the office, and you could physically down each server one at a time without a single break on the on-air product. And I mean, that that's huge you know i mean typically if an audio a hardware audio processor fails somebody's got to patch around it whether you reroute whether you switch to a different preset there's going to be a couple of seconds of silence while we figure out what to do and how to work around it so that that is pretty cool um elaine wants to know if you're getting any pushback about from customers about potential security issues or hacking and i'm going to answer that one elaine because that is quite literally the topic of next week's webinar um, uh, Shane Tobin from EMF is on, and uh, we are absolutely going to be looking at that in a lot more depth. So maybe Kirk will come back and uh, get involved in that one too. Of course, there are, there are various ways to implement security, and uh, what, you know, what, obviously what we want is the right people to access our systems and not the wrong people to access our systems. Uh, and when the right people access our systems, we want them to have access only to the things that, that they need to have, have access to. Right? That right so there, yep. A, a disc jockey doesn't need access to the back end, although frankly, if you know a, a disc jockey in a, in a good old brick and mortar studio walks in and hits a couple buttons on the on the keyboard and gets into the back end of the automation system can do all kinds of damage just today like this so you know what what are you doing now to keep somebody from erasing the um the the hard drive mapping on your automation system nothing you're probably not they, they probably have have the right to go in and and adjust you know where the automation looks for its traffic log for example so you know there's a we, we don't want to trust people outside our organization but inside the organization we we have a certain amount of trust i did i've spoken to a couple of people just recently um who are doing a lot of remote in fact uh, in december we're going to have a have a webinar on this topic of stations that are operating at the moment a hundred percent like you see right here because they had to they had no other choice and they've implemented um home uh, vpn from people's homes directly into their uh, their broadcast system and th and there's no access unless you are on a vpn with uh, with all the encryption and and the uh, two-factor authentication that's required and, and all that so um yeah it's it, it's it's a, it's a concern uh if you if you do it using you know standard best practices it is a very tiny concern because it's, it's the best we know how to do. And that's a real important thing because, I mean, you know, you, you and I first met 30 years ago. You were uh, doing transmitter engineering as a full-time gig. 
Mm -hmm. And how many times have you heard about somebody getting unemployed and the next thing you know, they've gone into remote control, star nine, nine pound and turned the transmitter off, you know, oh, and I mean, that. so it, it's like I tell folks, you've got to look at user accounts and passwords the same way you look at the keys to the building. And when somebody is gone, that needs to be cycled. <laughs> You know, we, we look at the past a lot of times with rose-colored glasses. I worked at a station where somebody got fired. They came back in uh, during the off hours and took the tape eraser to the huge carousel rack of carts, right? We're, ta we're talking about 150 commercials and jingles mm -hmm. and other work parts. And, they and yeah, uh, well, not entirely on. Most of them were like, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> <laughs> The, hey, hey! Let me throw this up on on the screen, uh, and I'll put this at at the end. Get your camera out if you want to see the whole or have access to the whole series we did on containerization. That QR code should take you to the website where where uh, at, at at Telus Alliance where you can make that happen. So I'm glad you brought that up because that was uh, something that I had really meant to um, to let you know that it was. Uh, I, I was hoping you'd. Uh, Put the plug in for that just if for no other reason then i can link to it and and and, and we did like a series of uh seven seven or eight uh w webinars and they're all titled in a way to help you out so if there's a title that you know nah, i don't need to know about clock sync in the cloud well just skip that one you know it, it's an hour that you don't need um mm -hmm. so just pick the ones that are interesting to you uh, the very last one we called it container university 301 that's the one where we actually show you these systems working and and so uh that that might be them if you want to see why hey, what can i really do with this does it really work show me what the benefit is go watch the very last one first if if, if you want to all right and one more uh, point on Elaine's question. Yeah. Um, so we, we do have systems working in a zero trust environment. So if you really wanted to lock down your uh, access really completely, uh, these containerized systems and virtual systems can still work in those environments. It just takes more time and effort to get them in and get them installed. So it's always that balance of um, what's the adage of um, convenience versus security is what you have to balance. Um, yeah. and usability so I, I do an IT security session for SBE on occasion which is kind of funny because I got out of tech support when I was spending more time setting IP addresses and troubleshooting power amps but uh, anyway that that's one of the things that I have beat the drum on a lot is, is the basic rule of thumb is the harder it is to access the more secure it is and and that's for the people you want to get into it so, so yeah, you, you definitely, like you said, it's a, a compromise between accessibility and uh, and um, and and other stuff. Uh, J. Cole McClellan saying uh, the phone doesn't do QR codes, wants the link. So uh, I'll give you make sure to remind me to uh, send you his contact info after, so you can do that. I'll have and, to go uh, back and engineer that. <laughs> there you go. I'll see if I can make a little Bitly link or something that's a little easier. <laughs> Um, and the, the engineers that I've talked to that are introducing this, you know, most, uh, not all, but most of the remote operators who are, you know, either just running a ball game or contributing audio live or voice tracked, whichever it may be, uh, most of them uh, are doing everything they need with a single computer at home. And so that's when it's, you, you don't have to implement router to router VPN. Um, you can just implement what a lot of people call road warrior VPN. So you'd like your sales staff out in the field, you know, they'll have a VPN client on their computer and they'll use that to get into your, your studio um, and, and access it via, via VPN. And you have the, obviously you can revoke their, their, uh, their access rights if you need to, if somebody, you know, has to go away, um, you can revoke their rights right away. All right, uh, let's see. So I just want to remind you that there you can implement containerization as well as virtualization, but containerization in different places, um, on-premises or in a data center. One benefit of a data center is it might be a locally owned business, like here in Nashville. Uh, I, I know of one data center that I've been to. It's locally owned. Um, it uh, it probably, you know, it doesn't have quite all the features of an AWS, but they do have uh, a, a backup power generator and they do have at least two sources of internet at this locally owned data center. But you get a cage. If you pay for it, you get a cage. If you want to stick your you know, your, your Omnia 11 in that cage, 
to go feed, you know, micro MPX through one of our, our encoders off to your transmitter site. You can do that. Now at AWS, you can't stick your Omnia 11 there. You, you know, when we virtualize that, uh, you can stick that or uh, Forza or, you know, some other thing in, in there, but the data center, you have some access. Public cloud, you have a lot of other benefits, uh, like they do this all the time for, for thousands of companies, um, but you don't, you, you can't put your Omni 11 there. It's It's gotta be something that is virtualized. Uh, David was mm -hmm. mentioning talking about security again. Once uh, got called by a local station that was off air, visited the transmitter, discovered the crystal was missing because the previous engineer had uh, held it hostage for payment. So again, keys are only as good as uh, the number of people you give them to, whether it's a user password or a physical device. You know that and that kind of hostage. That's okay if if if, if it's a mechanics lien. I don't. Not, I I think there's some federal law against disabling uh, federally licensed broadcast facilities but i'm not a it's lawyer at the very least not recommended yeah uh again just a just a picture here of on premises this is what it could look like on premises if you're in these things uh by the way I'll, I'll, the, the cost of a server is relatively low enough that you know buy two and one of them is a is a complete backup uh and then with with uh management systems for Docker like Kubernetes or Portainer, um, you can have either manual failover that you control or you can implement some automatic failure failover. I'm not an expert at that. We have do have some people at Telos Alliance who are pretty good at that. And of course, there's if you want to go to LinkedIn and find somebody in your town that's an expert at Kubernetes, that is a two minute search. Uh, so you can find people. Uh, you know, one of the things about implementing um, solutions on IT standard systems is there's a lot of people out there who understand this stuff. Even if I don't and you don't, there's people who who get you and I understand you know the the signal flow, what it needs to look like and sound like and work like. Uh, but how do you how do you control all that? There's plenty of people who who do that. Uh, so on premises with remote home studios accessing that. Uh, if it's off premises in public cloud, well. That, you know that that you'd still access it pretty much the the, the same way, um, and you could have you know a, a offsite uh, disaster recovery uh, that way. In fact, here is uh, just a, a similar picture with some disaster recovery in a data center. You might you know stick some hardware in in the data center, um, like I, I'm showing an Omni 11 and a, and a couple other things actually in the data center, and then. Uh, Container system management. Good thing is this is all standardized stuff now. We uh, we may not know about it or know much about it ourselves as broadcast engineers, but these these things all exist to to manage uh, a few or dozens or hundreds or even thousands of containers, which is exactly what they do in in, in data centers. Um, uh, um, yeah. Let me get here. William is uh, asked, and and he's, he apologizes if it's too specific a question. But are, are there plans for a physical interface to the virtual console, for example, using an existing IQ to control a uh, virtual Altus console? Sort That's of a great the question. Um, yeah. Right, right. So there's there's a couple ways to look at that, and it really depends upon the workflow that you're trying to achieve. Um, so there's one way to look at it kind of going in the reverse direction and saying if you have an IQ console or an element console, I think uh, I was interesting on a slide a couple slides ago, um, the guy in the lower left corner was using an element console but had a, a virtual system on the uh, screen above him. So um, gentleman down in the lower left. Mm -hmm. So you can have those two things working in parallel where you essentially have a, a virtual representation of a hardware product and those can work in concert with each other, either one mirroring the other or one expanding uh, the other one. Maybe you've got 14 physical faders and you want six more virtual faders because you have an election coming up. Um, so that's one way of thinking about virtualization and marrying products together. Um, and, and those uh, products that we sell all have remote solutions available. So for an IQX console, there's an HTML5 add-on for it. For Quasar, we have a product called Quasar Soft. So all of our different consoles have, um, I guess, virtual versions of them that work in concert with it. To go the other direction and say, let's start with a virtual product and then hang a physical product off the back of it, 
um, that can also be done. So keep your eye on Altus as we're working for ways to be able to allow that kind of synchronization between a container-based product and a, and a uh, classic hardware product. So there's ways of going it, but thinking about the workflow that you need, there may be a solution that exists today that'll do exactly what you want um, without necessarily need of a container deployment. So more to be more to be talked about on that. Yeah, I, I I got to speak with an engineer in the Pacific Northwest who had to implement um, home-based touchscreen and mouse-controlled consoles, um, and, and they, he's building real studios. But they had this gap of time when they were several stations were homeless. Basically, they had to operate from homes and um even the uh, even the uh uh wizened uh hosts they adapted very quickly to to touch screens and mouse based stuff it just it, he said it hasn't been a problem for them i i get it that you know 20 something still in college uh, you know it's it, no problem to operate touch screens um but it's a, he said it's it's been fine for the older folks too Oh, well, I'll tell you a funny story. It's 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 been oh, this is almost 20, maybe 25 years ago. Elaine will laugh because she might have even been around for that. Um, I used to some of you guys may know me from one of my stints back at the uh, the Harris Harris Allied days. And one of the products I was responsible for was that really cool DSE 7000 uh, AKG editor that later turned into the uh, uh, the Orban uh, the Orban product. And I remember sitting at a demo and it's this great box and it, it worked just like an eight track tape machine and punching in and punching out and a scrub wheel. And, and it was so familiar for all of us that grew up cutting tape. And I'm sitting with this engineer and he's scratching his head as I'm setting it up. He goes, so where's the mouse? Oh, no, no, you don't have this mouse. You got this great keyboard. And we're going through the demo. He's like, well, how do you zoom in on the waveform? No, 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 you don't zoom in. You use the scrub wheel, you, you edit by ear. And I realized at that moment that, you know, there's the shift. And not only did that customer not buy this, this product, uh, they went on to buy a fast eddy or something like that, that they can use a mouse and zoom in on. Um, but it was that seismic shift that you realize that if you didn't grow up on a tape machine, that box didn't have the same appeal. Mm, and we're right. seeing that kind of thing more and more folks. It's amazing how long um, iPads and things have been around already where people are, are grabbing things and if you can't pinch to zoom, there's a flaw in your software. So mm -hmm. looking at how fast things change, um, I think Kirk is right, is that is that the need to feel like you have to have a physical fader, um, it really depends upon the client you have and what you put in front of them. And, and right. you might be surprised what you get when they only have a touch screen. Yeah. Now the cool thing about software solutions, it's a double-edged sword. It's the really cool thing. And it's the really dangerous thing is that uh, it's only a few lines of code becomes almost a catchphrase. And, you know, can we add a spectrum analyzer to a transmitter? Absolutely. We can add a spectrum, just a few lines of code. Oh, can you make it do this? Yeah, we can make it do that. Can you make it do that? Well, eventually you keep adding stuff. You never release a product. So um, there, there are some challenges there. Um, let's see, Steve is uh, throwing a question here. What does AWS stand for? Well, that's Amazon Web Services. So Kirk was just illustrating one of the uh, offsite. I mean, there's Microsoft Azure, there's Zoom, there's uh, umpteen different uh, remote hosting services, but Amazon is probably arguably one of the bigger ones. And, and, uh, and Amazon seems committed to working with multimedia companies. So there are other people like uh, Grass Valley, um, that has containerized, virtualized video productions stuff available, and and it it works yep. with AWS. And I think VizRT is the same way. So if if you talk to AWS, they are reaching out and partnering with media production companies because they see a a, a good marriage there. Yeah, and Steve and is reason, also asking. Oops, sorry. Go ahead, Cam. I was just going to say the the reason that's really important goes back to a question somebody was asking earlier about things like synchronization. So when you need to synchronize everything, does your cloud provider understand what that means and have the tools to be able to do it? And AWS will give you PTP clock inside of their environment to synchronize your containers, whereas somebody who might not be media savvy, especially if you go with just a public cloud provider that's a little smaller and a little more local, they might not have any idea what to do with, with multicast audio in the cloud or, or what to do, how to get PTP clock into their containers. 
So that's kind of why we use AWS as this example in our slides is they've come the farthest, the fastest, and they're most interested in working with broadcast companies, understanding what our needs are and putting the tools in place to help us get there. So they've been really good to work with. Right. And, and Steve had also asked for a little more clarification on virtual versus containerized. And ah. uh, so, so he did reference the uh, virtual machine uses the OS for each software package where containerization shares the OS amongst the different packages. But as Kirk said, there's a lot more to it than that. Well, and uh, that, that it, it, container, you know, yeah, go ahead. I, I, you know, we're all used to running one OS and a bunch of apps at the same time, right? I mean, here on my computer, I got a browser running and maybe two browsers running plus uh, WebEx. And um, I'm not sure what else. I've got a computer in uh, Greenville, Mississippi, that's running uh, five instances of the free Pira Silence sensor. Uh, it's running uh, Zipstream software from uh, from from Telos Alliance, that's encoding five radio stations for for the web, plus a, a test stream, a private stream. Uh, it's also running Omnia SST. Uh, FM processing software and micro MPX encoding sending to that translator that we talked about. Um, I'm not sure what else. Is, oh, it, it and it's it's running uh, whatever uh, SecureNet systems, which is a CDN, a content distribution network, uh, requires for their metadata to be present on their players. So it's it's running a bunch of different stuff. Let's it's my go-to machine to run a browser to go check into this piece of equipment or that. Oh, it's probably running some uh, instances of uh, Magic RDS to put RDS on, on our stations uh, through the, the peer of brand stuff. So it's, it's doing a lot now. So why not just do that? Well, we all know that apps can interfere with each other. And an app going bad, you know, you may have to reboot the whole machine when it was just one app that went bad. And apps aren't individually controllable from a central location. So VMs, virtual machines, those have been popular, you know, for close to 20 years now. Um, when we came out with multi-core CPUs and lots of RAM, it became possible to run a hypervisor like VMware uh, or Proxmox or one of those things, and then run one or more or several or a dozen operating systems on top of that. The downside of VMs is that each operating system that you instantiate on that machine comes with its own baggage. You know, it, it, if you install Windows as an OS, it comes with solitaire, right? Okay, I, that's not a big thing, a, a, a big wipeout, but look at all the things that Windows runs, uh, you know, as services in the background, and how many of them do you need to run your, your, to, you know, to run your, your, your caged your Apple, your firewalled application. And so VMs are just inefficient for doing what we need to do. They've worked for years, but now the technology is moving toward containers, Docker containers, um, is the, the the brand name of the company that kind of got this started, but now it's a standard. Um, and so containers are very efficient. They only use what they got to use. They're most they're almost completely firewalled from other stuff going wrong in the machine, and they they, they just use as little resources as you, you could get by with, and still get the job done that you need. One yep. difference of of a container that we're that we're interested in using we as broadcast engineers is ours do require some fairly real time operation with CPUs. So we will do um, perhaps CPU pinning where we assign, okay, this container gets that CPU and nobody else does. So that's, that's one of the things that's different uh, about running containers in a broadcast environment. Now, um, Mark, hey, Kirk, one other thing to, that's uh, really important. Uh, go, go, I'll Ken. say one other thing that's really important, the, the reason that efficiency and size comes into play, and, and we haven't really talked about price, but that's why containers have really become popular is the bloat of virtual machines um, will bankrupt you if you start trying to run this in a cloud environment because you're paying for every byte of storage, you're paying for every CPU tick that runs. And so if there's a way to make that be more efficient from both a storage and an operation standpoint, you can run these on smaller CPUs, which require, again, less cost, less storage space, less bandwidth, less compute power. So that's really the idea is you can't have um, an infrastructure that's deployed the same way you would deploy Windows with its, you know, seven gigabyte download disk and all the other things that come with it um, right. and expect to have an efficient facility running up in the cloud. So that's yeah. uh, that's the main the main turn on for containers and why they become adopted so broadly across these industries is the efficiency and the cost that comes with that. Right. Now, I mean, if you're running a local machine with like LTSC version of Windows without all the, the bloat, 
than uh, than virtualization. And uh, I see Shane Tobin's in. I think Shane is uh, sitting in an airport in Honolulu right now. So we may grab him in a couple of seconds to talk about what he's doing. Going to give everybody the usual heads up. We're a couple minutes to the top of the hour. I've not finished one of these on time yet. I don't see any reason to start now. Um, so we'll probably run another 15 or 20 minutes. Um, Mark did ask, is Docker the most popular container system management software, and are, are there others you would recommend? And, and you all are pretty much standardized on Docker. It's pretty much the standard anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm, I, and I'm not exactly 100% sure why. Uh, we avoid saying Docker, but we are OCI compliant um, because there are other people involved here. I, I think the industry didn't want one company uh, controlling the standard, and and I think Docker uh, understood that as well. Um, so that 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 probably has to do why we don't say Docker, even though it's it's the Docker runtime that gets installed on the Linux OS. Which um, is that we use that we use the Docker runtime because that's what we started with. It's what we know. It is the most popular one, but everything, as Kirk said, is written to a standard. And I'm scratching my head trying to remember what the alternate one was that we explored for a while, and I can't mm -hmm. think of it offhand. But there are other container runtime engines out there that you can that you can try to use. Uh, one of the things that we tell folks is that is that in order we we kind of recommend that people use Docker. We recommend that people use a specific flavor of Ubuntu. And that way we've eliminated some of the variables that come up with, wait a minute, you know, why doesn't this work exactly right? Yeah. So right. it is possible to do things in different flavors. People have done that successfully. It's just Telos can't be experts in everything. So we've decided that these are the ones that we're going to put our expertise on. Well, and that's, uh, you hit a really key thing. And I mean, I'm sort of, a, I guess, well, Kirk and I had the uh, discussion about my feelings of the iDevice earlier, but um, I, I'm this guy that got dragged into Linux kicking and screaming. I've got uh, three Linux machines in the house all running different versions, and one may have a driver available, one may not, whereas with a Windows device, at least you've got some level of, of uh, consistency. Um, the Joseph had asked, uh, mentioned having two host servers with one being backup, wonder of splitting the container stations between the two. So if one went down, not all the stations would be affected, could be. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, ultimately, again, this just comes back to flexibility. It's what works for your situation. You've got the power to do what you want. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't have a lot of uh, experience with Portainer or Kubernetes, uh, but obviously th these are the tools that are used by real IT professionals to make sure that downtime is literally milliseconds and not not even seconds or minutes, um, yeah. that you can do all these things automatically. I can't pretend to tell you that I know how to do this, although I'm learning these things kind of one step at, at a time. Um, in the in, in the broadcast world, if you do go to full-time this kind of thing for all your stuff, uh, you're going to want to learn about these things. Um, yeah. So uh, it, 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 every time a new technology comes along, we got to learn about it. I mean, when we, we went from tube transmitters uh, and, and Nautel, you know, killed them off uh, uh, mercilessly. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> we, had to, we had to learn about solid state stuff and, you know, what an amplifier palette was. Somewhere I've got still got my save the tube stop not tell <laughs> around, but I don't think it's right in reach at my desk. Um, one of the, and Curtis called me out. He said I, I we did end one session uh, about ten minutes before the hour, so uh, so that was untrue. It, 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 there have been one or two that didn't go late. Um, Let's see. Is that your last slide there, Kirk? Or you got another? Yeah, I, I I skipped a few just because the the okay. conversation's going really well. People are having some some good questions, yeah. and I so think we ought to continue. Let's leave that one up for a moment, and I am going to unmute Mr. Shane Tobin, and uh, let's, uh, there, Shane, can you hear us, Shane? I can. Hey, guys, uh, sorry if I uh, if we get interrupted here. I'm uh, in an airport, and uh, you're liable to hear some departure announcements, I'm sure, but uh, hopefully my uh, my uh, uh, Apple uh, earbuds are doing the job here. So. They are. You sound great. Mahalo. Ah, mahalo. <laughs> Kirk, so, I was actually just down at uh, one of your stations there. I know, I know. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, An American get, uh, Samoa. Did you get Russ all set up? Uh, he, yeah, they, I guess they got uh, got done what needed to be done. Uh, a couple of things that still need to be uh, taken care of, but uh, yeah, I got a lot of stuff done down there. So. 
Now, you made a comment in here, and this is partly why I opened your mic so quick, but uh, you talked about clustering. Yes. So um, I don't know. I don't know if you uh, maybe made reference to it earlier in the show. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to be on here or not. But um, I actually uh, one of the things I did was actually uh, I've been looking at this for quite a while uh, and following virtualization. But I finally just dived in head first and uh, built up a little system. I'm going um, to no, uh, take control again and throw your slide deck no. back on the screen. So let's just give me a click because I've got the I, I stole your uh, post from the Broadcasters Club. And uh, oh, nice. what's on the screen now? Is it loads? Yep, there it is. So ignore so, the wall of text, but tell us the story. So basically, um, I uh, went down to uh, American Samoa just to. I mean, it's been a, it's been a few years. I built this station back in 2019 before the pandemic, so obviously I haven't visited it in a in a while. But uh, there were some things that need to be done down there: some firewall updates and. Uh, you know, installing a, a receiver, a different receiver to replace some old audio codecs. Um, but uh, while I was down there, I decided to see what I could do about uh, improving our uh, audio processing and STL solution. Um, so I had been uh, kind of experimenting with uh, virtualiza uh, virtualization in. Uh, This is where we wonder if we go. There he's back. I'm still here. Yeah, I had a phone call come in. Sorry, I'm going to put it on Do Not Disturb so that didn't happen. Uh, anyway, um, so there's a hypervisor called Proxmox. And for those of you who don't know what a hypervisor is, it's basically just a bare, an OS that runs on your, on your hardware that can host a bunch of virtual machines and pass hardware from your physical machine to your virtual machines. Um, so it's kind of the traffic cop between the go-between between your virtual machines and the physical hardware. Uh, one of the cool parts about it, though, is that you can basically assign uh, as much CPU resources and RAM and hard drive uh, resources as you have to those virtual machines in any combination that you want. Uh, you can also set up multiple machines to act together as um, as a cluster. Um, you set up multiple nodes, and what they'll do is they'll basically just mirror each other and sit there in real time. Um, this system is just a single node, um, pretty simple. Uh, it's a one RU super micro chassis. It's got it's actually even just got a little atom processor in there, so it's not super super powerful, uh, but uh, it had enough room to uh, you know to run an instance of uh, some remote control software. Uh, from Automat and a uh, and a uh, audio processing software from uh, from Stereo Tool, so I took that and um, set that up running Micro MPX, a little decoder on a Raspberry Pi, um, put that out at the transmitter site over, uh, believe it or not, over a LAN link. Uh, we all know <laughs> how wonderful those things are, uh, but I managed to to, uh, to set the parameters up so that it was actually able to pass audio over that, and it sounded just miles better than the old 950 STL that uh, that had been in service there and the uh, previous processor. So uh, anyway, it's it's you know it it can be a lot simpler than the kind of the, uh, it might seem. And uh, I have to admit I haven't played around with containers a whole lot, but uh, for kind of heavier things like uh, you know like processing, uh, sometimes maybe a dedicated machine might make more sense. I, again, it really just depends on the applications and. Um, you know, whether you've got the resources to do you know, multiple machines or whether you want to put them in, in you know, kind of scale things back, put them in containers. Um, yeah, there are a, a million different ways to do this, but I mean, I've got this system running, you know, halfway around the world on a small, small island in the South Pacific, and it really didn't take all that much to put together. So it, it, this whole technology scales really, really well. My employer, on the other hand, is putting together something on a much larger scale for uh, for some other stuff. So yeah, it, it, it scales really, really well. I, th I think that's, uh, and that comes back to that thing that uh, Cam and I were talking about earlier. It's all power and flexibility and, and just Thanks. having more options. Um, right. Now, I am going to flick, uh, we'll skip past the cloud thing where we are over time. It's a big, big, big deal. And this is the thing that we really suck at as an industry collectively, is you got to document everything, especially if I've got a box with six different things running in it, I need to know what those six things are. So, I mean, th this is eDraw Max. Uh, there are umpteen different network uh, mapping tools out there. But, uh, but yeah, map it 
oh my goodness, people, document what you're doing. Um, and number two, and I'm leaving, uh, leaving Shane kind of unmuted for this, but this is uh, leading into next week's conversation. If somebody who looks a lot like me gets on something that looks a lot like Shodan and starts uh, searching stuff, I shouldn't see that many open ports at any IP address. And, um, you know, so IT security is huge. And Shane, you and I are talking about it next week, uh, more from uh, how the manufacturers lock the doors. But, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't be able now, and I did not try to log into the Volt because, well, that, that would be illegal. Um, not to say I won't try to do it with an Autel transmitter, just because I can. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to believe that we're still having this conversation about network security after, I mean, 20, 2021, there was a, a ransomware attack every 11 seconds. Yeah, I mentioned firewalls. That was one of the things I went down there to, uh, to do was to update uh, the firewalls. Um, we've kind of moved toward a zero trust model with, a, with the firewalls now. And um, yeah, instead of uh, just kind of, if you can't see it, you can't hack it. Uh, at least that's in theory. <laughs> it's a lot harder to hack if you can't actually yeah. see it. So. Well, and I mean, I uh, don't have my personal cell in front of me, but it reports the mesh network here in the house. And I can tell you that last week, I get the report every Sunday night. And last week, we had 987,000 port scans in a seven-day period at the house. You need to quit making enemies, Jeff. Dude, that's my friend. <laughs> that's your friend. <laughs> With friends like that. <laughs> Hey, you keep talking IT security, people are like, well, and so I, I did this on purpose one day. I, I published my IP address and said, uh, you know, our uh, quite literally our ISP, if I call in for support, they'll ask me to take the firewall down so they can uh, so they can see the network themselves. And I figure if the people that sold it to me uh, can't find it, then I'm probably doing mostly okay. So uh, now I'm going to get too cocky with this someday and somebody's going to break through and bad things are going to happen. Hey, so, uh, hey, 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 Jeff, I, I'd like to put a, a nice exclamation point on what Shane has described. Is there any chance you could get you could uh, share my screen again? I've got a live absolutely. live picture of not his Raspberry Pi, but a similar thing going on here. Let's see, that's the wrong button. Uh, back to Kirk Karnak and make him the presenter there. You should have it now. There we go. And let's see if I can just show my screen number two instead. And there we go. So what you see there is the result of this micro MPX technology. This lets you know, and there's other technology that lets you send MPX over IP. That's not exactly new, although neither is micro M MPX. You can do this at much higher bit rates uh, with a number of different products that are out there on the market. So if, if you've got lots of bandwidth, um, there are other things that you can use as well. They operate anywhere from two, two and a half, four, five, six megabits per second. Uh, this is operating at, um, this is mine, so it's 320 kilobits per second plus a little bit of um, forward error correction and, and some packetization overhead. I think overall we're looking at a, a right about 500 kilobits per second. Uh, so the equivalent of five VoIP phone calls at the same time. And this is a live look at a translator site that I have, but it's this similar to what uh, Shane is doing. And so uh, on the upper left, the data stream, that's a nice straight line. That means there's no lost packets in my case. Uh, there's the waveform of what's coming out. This is a talk station, which is why there's periods of silence here. It's not music, it's talk. Um, and then there's the MPX waveform that us as we as broadcast engineers we're familiar with, including the RDS signal gets uh, gets brought along with this as well. So I've implemented this not only at a couple of my own stations, but also at a community broadcaster in Memphis, very popular station, WEVL, Weevil. They lost their ability to double hop their 950 megahertz STL due to some rooftop changes that they had no control over. And so they had to do something. Something. And so just literally in the nick of time, we got them on micro MPX system. Uh, and they're still using their old original Orban processor. They like it. It's an 8100, but they bought the encoder to go at the studio and the decoder at the transmitter site, the same ISP at both ends. And that's helpful anyway, because you're 
pretty well assured that your data doesn't have to go out of town to three different you know junction points around the country before it comes uh, to your transmitter site. And this is what we're talking about. This could be just as well be encoded in the cloud at a data center or at your studio on premises and sent to your transmitter sites. And this micro MPX technology, as it's implemented uh, by Omnia and, and also by others, uh, you can have dual path. So you can have pa packet by packet redundancy. So if you lose a path, uh, and, you know, hey, one of the paths could be SpaceX, uh, Starlink, uh, could, could be your cable provider, could be a, an IP radio link. So there's, there's options there. Uh, one caveat, and I'll, I'll throw that out there because the, you brought up a really good point right there. Um, coming back to the, uh, the backhoe and the fiber analogy, um, if you do have a backup ISP and you're, you're running dual ISPs, make sure that your backup is not running on the same physical infrastructure as your main, because a lot of times that's what will happen. Your backup ISP will be leasing space on your main, and it's the same fiber. So when the fiber seeking backhoe comes along, you're just as off the air on both. Yeah. Um, I'm going to flip control back. We are pushing closer to the quarter of the hour, and uh, this is the, the part where, let's see, whoops, not if I hit the wrong button. Um, let's hit all the right buttons for a change. So that really does take a lot of the fun out. But um, it, it's uh, one of those things that, uh, as I say, next week we're talking about security. We're going to have a lot of fun with that. Um, we do have lots of online information. Uh, for what it's worth, I did take a quick peek at the, uh, at the QR code, Kirk, um, success.ellosalliance.com should uh, take you to the Container University page. Again, success.telosalliance.com for anybody that uh, didn't have the ability to scan the QR code. So on that note, as I say, this webinar will be uh, um, archived. Uh, it is usually really prompt about getting that stuff done quickly. Um, we've got a Waves newsletter just came out. I think I was talking about son of a gun, IT security and that too, as a matter of fact. Um, I want to Really, Kirk, I want to thank you and uh, Cam both for taking time out of your day. It's it's been a great time, and and uh, you know, kind of Kirk and I kind of ran away and left poor Cam dangling. I'm sorry about that, but how oh, you guys are fine. <laughs> I, I think at this point you're probably used to both of us. <laughs> I let the smart guys do the talking; otherwise, people might catch on. <clears throat> so. Mark uh, says, quick question for Cam. What is his favorite baseball behind him? Oh, man, favorite baseball. That's an excellent question. Um, there is one up there that is a Reggie Jackson baseball. So um, without tipping my hat as to who my favorite team was as a kid, because then I get a lot of hate mail. But um, that's that's probably the one up there is, uh, uh, you know, good old Mr. October. Nice, nice. Now, Elaine excellent is a uh, question to end on. Well, there you go. Elaine did throw a dinosaur <laughs> comment in earlier when somebody was talking about the Harris days. I don't don't know what that could have been in reference to. And uh, she did wish uh, the two of you a nice Thanksgiving and me a nice second Thanksgiving. Now, it's no secret my wife's American, so uh, I'll be. I was on the road for Canadian Thanksgiving, so I'm doing U.S. Thanksgiving this year. So the turkey is defrosting as we speak. And uh, and. Uh, Anyway, on that note, I want to thank both of you folks. I really want to thank all y'all for uh, hanging out with us for an hour and 15 minutes. It's been a great day, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week. Thanks much. Bye now. Thanks, everybody.